Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sandra Musial. I'm going to be talking on whole food plant-based nutrition and cardiovascular disease um, prevention in relation to nutrition. Hang on. There we go. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I started a, um, a a nonprofit called Plant Docs. I'm the founder and the president, and I run it. That's all I'm doing right now. I quit my like day job as a doctor a year ago during COVID when I just had enough. <laughs> and so I am a food as medicine specialist. I'm board certified in pediatrics and obesity medicine. I'm an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Brown. I taught at Hasbro for the last 11 years. And before that, I was in private practice for 13 years. And then I've done like kind of side training on my own to get to a place where I feel like I can teach food as medicine. Um, I did the culinary coaching course at Harvard and a plant-based nutrition certificate from Cornell. And I did a one-year Institute of Integrative Nutrition. I'm also a lactation consultant um, and I have an undergraduate degree in nutrition. And I love gardening and I started a garden at Hasbro. <laughs> so those are my credentials. I have not, nothing to disclose. So Anne Wigmore said, the food that you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Have you guys heard this quote before? I start every talk with it because it really kind of defines what I do. That when you eat, there's a spectrum. The food that we have available to us in the United States as humans is this huge spectrum from A to F, right? So like A foods are fighting disease. They're um, anti-inflammatory and they create an environment in our body to optimize our immune system and fight disease and be super healthy. Or if we eat from the F side of the spectrum, which, you know, it's just so prevalent and easy to do, we are feeding disease um, because it's promoting um, inflammation in the body. Which, you know, when you think about this, the food you eat can either be go one way or the other. What is food? So the def here's a couple of definitions that I found. Food is a product eaten regularly by a group that has recognized its harmlessness and long-term benefits. So if you're really eating, you know, F foods that are leading to heart disease and high blood pressure and cancer, is it really food? Or any nutritious substance that people or animals eat in order to maintain life and grow. So just some food for thought. <laughs> Um, so breast milk is the optimal food for a human baby. And I put this slide up here just to give you a little perspective. So breast milk, if you think like, I, I, this is a woman in Honduras. I've done a lot of work there. Everyone breastfeeds there. It's a very kind of primitive, rural, remote um, village. And there just isn't formula there. There isn't a lot of refrigeration. Everyone breastfeeds. So that's the way it used to be, right? That was the norm. That was the, the default. Then formula came along and uh, as you're aware, like in the 60s and 70s, people were told that this was superior to breast milk. People, doctors were actually um, told parents and moms not to breastfeed. As in my case, I was born in 65. And, and then there was this switch swaying back the other way, like, oh, wait a minute, breast milk is actually better. Let's try to get moms to breastfeed again. So then we're telling everyone, you should breastfeed because it lowers rates of um, ear infections, it lowers rates of pneumonia, it lowers um, cancer rates and obesity and all these things. But I just like you to think about it the other way around. Actually, that, that's what it's supposed to be, right? We're supposed to breastfeed. You're supposed to have all those lower rates. When you formula feed, you're increasing your rates of ear infections, pneumonia, lymphoma, cancer, you know, like, so it's just kind of a different way of thinking about it. So I just like use that as a metaphor for food. Like we're supposed to eat whole plant foods from the ground and things in their whole state. We're not supposed to eat all this processed foods that have been refined. And we're not supposed to have heart disease and hypertension and high cholesterol when we're 50 and get cancer. So just throw that out there. So you, I love this slide, you are what you eat. I use this a lot when I'm, I, I do most of my classes are for um, non-medical professionals. And this just hits home with a lot of people that 
our cells are constantly turning over. So where, where do our cells get the building blocks to make new cells? You know, it has to come from what we're ingesting to make the um, all the building blocks. So you literally, whatever you eat is breaking down and becoming your new cells. So this new kind of specialty in medicine, um, food is medicine or um, lifestyle medicine, I'm kind of focusing in just on the food aspect of it. I'm thinking of the food that we eat as being medicine for our bodies, for being healing. How can we use it in a medicinal way, in a healing way, in a health promoting, immune boosting way? But it can be very confusing in our society. People are confused what is actually healthy. If you had this for your car, um, you there was no question what you're going to put in it for fuel, right? If you're going to put like the best gasoline you can find, even if this were your car, you're still going to put gas in it. You're not going to choose soda, right? It's like just that simple. But with um, the human body and human society, we um, have made eating very, very complicated. And there's all kinds of um, influences and media and publications and even doctors presenting um, conflicting information. There's all kinds of fad diets that people grab onto. And even the government plays a big role in millions of dollars spent on lobbyists. Um, even when they have like boards to determine the um, RDAs, there are people that sit on the boards from the dairy and the meat industry that you know have a, their own agenda. It's not just about science. Um, it's influenced by by big big money, these big food industries. So no wonder people are confused. What is the best thing to eat? I show these slides from the um, there used to be a magazine called Life Magazine, and this was. They did this kind of population interest study in different countries of the world, what a typical family ate in a week. Have you guys seen these slides before? So this is a family of nine in Ecuador. Um, and you can see they're eating a lot of plantains and bananas. You know, they're, they're eating what's in season, what's local, what's available to them. But it's basically all whole foods, potatoes, um, plant foods. In Turkey, here's a family of six. Um, with some breads that they made, but it's still a lot of locally grown um, whole foods. And I just compare these two societies to the American family of four with all this food. And it's, you know, all packaged and processed, sugar, unhealthy fats, hardly anything in its whole state, except like the grapes and the tomatoes. So no wonder that of the 2 million species on the planet, only three have a problem with their weight. Have you seen this before? So, I mean, think about it. All these animals, they're just eating what they're meant to eat. They're, it's, they're not being influenced in these weird ways or making weird processed food that shouldn't be eaten. Only humans and the pets we feed suffer from obesity out of 2 million species doing something wrong, especially, I don't have all these charts, but there's like a whole series of them from 1980, or this is just the 2020 map um, with the um, high rates of obesity throughout the United States. And along with that, we've seen increase in heart disease and how we're managing heart disease in the traditional allotopic approach for hypertension, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, it's, it's almost, you know, across the board, we give pills for these things. We try to, as physicians, encourage a healthy diet, but it's just so easy to give a pill. People expect the pill. And to make a behavior change and change your diet takes a lot more work, but can be very effective and is a much better approach. And surgical approaches to um, chronic medical conditions um, is very common. There's around 250,000 sleeve gastrectomies done yearly and um, cabbage operations for heart surgery. 
So as physicians, are we providing sick care or health care? Sick care is damage control, reactively managing a sickness as a result of poor lifestyle choices. Whereas healthcare is a form of wellness, proactively creating true health by preventing disease through healthy lifestyle choices. So as a physician, and um, you can influence your patients, there's, they can make a decision with their fork, fork in the road. You can choose kind of this traditional approach of pills and surgery, or, you know, I think patients should be given this choice. You can make lifestyle choices, or you can take these pills, but they need to know that there is a choice. And we need to get people, convince people to get out of this pills and surgery line. And just by making healthy food choices, they can um, have a, a much higher quality of life with less disease burden, morbidities, and mortality. So there's different dietary patterns when we're studying nutrition. It's a little more complicated than studying like a new drug that you compare to a control drug and you follow them for X amount of time. What people eat is really complicated and you have to follow people, people for decades often to know the effect of different diets. So we have to base a lot of our conclusions on um, population studies. But the different dietary patterns, there's, and this may be um, repetitive. I know you've had like a couple lectures, but is, have you seen this slide before? No, okay. So um, we're comparing the Western diet, which is the standard American diet, to a healthy US diet, to a Mediterranean diet, to plant-based diet. And then I'm gonna go more deep detail on plant-based. So for a Western diet, the protein is more fatty meats, processed meats. Healthy US is like leaner meats. You cut off the fat, you take the skin off the chicken. A Mediterranean diet focuses more and more on beans and lentils and fish, where a plant-based diet um, eliminates all animal sources of protein. Dairy is whole fat in a Western diet, low fat or skim in a healthy US diet, some cheese in the Mediterranean diet and just plant-based milks. The carbs are sugary, processed kinds of um, forms in the Western diet. The a healthy U.S. diet, someone might have like brown rice or wheat bread. Um, in a Mediterranean diet, it's mostly whole grains and same with a plant-based diet. And the fats and oils are butter and frying oils in the Western diet more margarine or vegetable oil in a healthy U.S. diet, olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, and oils are really minimized in, in whole food plant-based diets. And then vegetables and fruits are you know, low, medium, high as you go across the board, and beverages go from sweetened, unsweetened. And the Mediterranean is more wine and coffee, and plant-based diet has more unsweetened drinks. And then th this is a great one to differentiate because just because someone's vegan doesn't mean they're healthy. So this is some, the differences between a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, and a whole food plant-based diet. So on a vegan diet, there's just absolutely no animal products. It's more philosophical thing about not eating animals. Whereas on a plant-based diet, it's about minimizing animal products. Um, that's what the yellow dash means, like avoiding or minimizing. The oils um, might be a part of a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, but it's not a part of a whole food plant-based diet. And then whole grains, fruits, veggies, starchy veggies, and legumes are part of, of all the diets. So the two big differences are the oils and the highly processed foods. So when someone says they're vegan, like they could eat, you know, super unhealthy, refined, like just pasta and white rice and um, fried Oreos and that's not necessarily healthy. <laughs> so um, here's a dozen fruits and vegetables. I'm gonna just go over less than a dozen studies, but just highlight some important ones. And I think I always bring this one up because Dean Orner first published this research 30 years ago that um, coronary artery disease could be reversed with a whole food plant-based diet. Yet, I, I meet people all the time that have had a heart attack and don't realize their condition is reversible. So I don't understand the lag 
between what we've known for 30 years and, and um, this knowledge not getting through to the patients. But he was the first one to show this. And then um, Caldwell Esselstyn um, also did have showed this quite a, um, a while ago. He, um, this is just one particular patient showing the coronary artery where it was diseased on the left and 18 months later after being on a super low fat whole food plant-based diet, reversed the plaques. I think I might've skipped over. Yeah, this was some of the results from um, Caldwell Esselstyn. This was only 22 patients, but they were like severely affected um, coronary artery disease where they were gonna die within a few months that they were told there was absolutely no surgery or medication that were gonna help these patients. And he he literally like fed them and and he wanted to see, could he reverse the plaques and um, increase their lifespan? And five people did drop out within two years, 17 maintained the diet, 11 completed five and a half years. Of those 11 participants, um, they reduced their cholesterol. Between them, they had 25 lesions. Half of them regressed, 14 remained stable. Um, disease, this is the most important line, was clinically arrested in all 11 participants with no new heart attacks. Um, and then after 10 years, the 11 patients of the 11 patients, six continued on the diet, had no further coronary events. Um, so this is like, um, after 10 years, whereas the five dropouts who resumed their previous diet all had coronary events. So, the, you know, this is old, old studies that have shown this. So we've known this for a while. The blue zones, have you guys heard about the blue zones? The areas of the world, geographic areas of the world that have the greatest amount of people that live to be over 100. It was originally started from this National Geographic study, but a lot has come out of this um, kind of research and studying these populations. Why do they live so long? What is it about it? Um, just interesting read. But this is just one um, graph showing mortality rates from coronary heart disease and cancers. And it's comparing the dark black is the, um, this it's the Southern Island um, off of Japan called Okinawa. And then the white is Japan in general. And the, and the hash one is the United States. And just note that the 193 and the 177, that this is like way off the chart. It's almost, you know, double um, comparing the whole rates of um, coronary heart disease, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. This is um, the population impact of poor diet is profound. This is showing that dietary risk is the number one contributor um, to death in the United States. Um, this was published in um, JAMA. And the of the, um, you know, the, the risk factors that are the most, um, the biggest leading risk factors are related, except for the two green X's, are all related to, to diet. The um, high blood pressure, high body mass index, high fasting, plasma glucose, high cholesterol, it's all related to the diet that you eat. So the, um, if we could just focus a little more on nutrition on the US population, we could really affect um, our mortality rates. This was a meta-analysis looking on looking at different, all different studies and different aspects of the diet and how it contributed to um, cardiovascular risk. And that one, that um, vertical line means that's kind of like no effect. And to the right of it is, um, a, a bad effect and to the left of it's a good effect. So um, it's just showing that the processed meats, um, that top line with the arrow is, you know, by far showing um, the, the greatest um, detrimental effect to cardio cardiovascular disease and refined grains, SSBs is sugar sweetened beverages and the, the Western diet are all kind of risks for cardiovascular disease. So um, then here's a couple more studies. This sh is showing that vegetarian dietary patterns play a role in heart disease. Um, 
that a healthy lifestyle choices may reduce the risk of um, MIs by 80% with nutrition playing a key role. And um, plant-based diets are the only dietary pattern to have shown reversal of coronary artery diseases. Blocked arteries and unblocked, blocked arteries are unblocked partially or fully in as many as 91% of patients. Um, and, and hypertension risks drop by 34% just a summary of this. And this was another study um, in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it was a British study. It's called the um, Epic Oxford Cohort Study. It was looking at over 44,000 men and women in England and Scotland, comparing um, vegetarian to non-vegetarian. And Compared to the non-vegetarians, the vegetarians had a lower mean BMI, lower mean non-HDL cholesterol, a lower systolic blood pressure, and 32% lower risk of ischemic heart disease. And this is looking at almost 26,000 women from the Women's Health Study, followed for 12 years, looked at 40 biomarkers, and those with the highest Mediterranean diet intake had up to 28% less um, cardiovascular disease events. And then I just threw in um, a couple specific things that, you know, they're, that are, they're studying all kinds of things. You can like look up any specific like plant food and find studies on Swiss chard or whatever, but the, regarding um, high blood pressure, there's been a lot of studies on flaxseed and a lot of studies on um, hibiscus tea showing, showing um, lowering and, and no real downside, right? It's, there's no side effects to these things. To, so like, even though like, um, you know, some of the studies can be criticized, it's not, it's hibiscus tea, you know what I mean? So like, I, I encourage patients, um, I give them a list of like, eat these 10 foods to try to, you know, help with your high blood pressure. So then there's, I'm gonna show you just three studies that show how quickly cardiovascular disease can be improved. In four weeks, um, this is a study um, that was done on 31 participants on a low fat um, whole food plant-based diet. They had um, significant reductions in blood pressure, lipids, medication usage, and other risks of cardiovascular disease in four weeks. This is um, an ongoing kind of program at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and the results that they're getting, they're doing a whole food plant-based diet, but they're also doing no nuts, no avocado, um, which is also what Dr. Esselstyn does. But they're showing, you know, this is after 15 days, they're showing some, you know, weight loss, drop in systolic blood pressure, 26 point drop in total cholesterol overall, but a 44 drop in people who had cholesterol greater than 200. LDL drop of 19, but 33 for people who had an LDL over 100 and um, fasting glucose drop. So um, I, along with my two partners, Dr. Lee and Dr. Stein um, started Plant Docs in 2019 at um, Plant City. And we started it as this live program, which is, it's similar to the Rochester one that I just learned about like a couple of weeks ago. But ours, we made ours a month long. The three of us doctors run it and created it. We do blood work before and after, blood pressure, weights. Um, we have two in-person kind of educational programs. We teach them kind of the stuff we talked about a little bit, um, but we go over um, like how to meal plan, how to shop, how to read labels. Um, and then the cooking classes are remote. So they, we give them an ingredient list, they go out and shop, and then the three of us get together and then we all cook over Zoom and um, we make a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner in a 90 minute period. And, and there's usually like leftovers so they can have like a second dinner or a couple of lunches. So we try to show them like, it doesn't take that much time to make like all these meals. And then there's a one-on-one -on -one physician appointment afterwards and they have unlimited access to me for texting. And, um, and then I'm gonna share my results. Oh, this is my two partners. And this is what Plant City Cellar looks like. Some of the books that we 
use. And that's where we do our live presentations. And this was one of our um, early on early groups. And this is what our Zoom classes look like. We kind of film them and, and they're very informal. Like everyone's unmuted, just going, what's that you're doing now? Or what do I do with, how do you get that, you know, shop like that? It, it's great. They're really fun and, and the people get to know one another. So part of the part of the process of the bonding is very, um, keeps people together. But this is, I've done 12 jump starts, so a, around 150 people. And this is our the N. Our Ns are small because we don't always have before and after data on everyone. But average weight loss is four pounds. If their BMI is over 30, it's five pounds in a month time. And this isn't the biggest loser, right? It's not a weight loss program. Biggest loser like never works because they get hungry and their hormones kick in and they're starving and they have craving. This is like perfect weight loss for, for anyone who's overweight. Um, and these are quotes that testimonials people sent in. Um, the, the total cholesterol drop in our program is 25. If it's over 200, it's 38. And we call the biggest loser who dropped their um, cholesterol the most 119 points um, in one month. Crazy, right? And then the LDL, the bad cholesterol, the average drop is 10. For over 100, it's 22. Biggest loser was 92 points. Um, and then triglyceride drops, um, if it's elevated, is 22. Top dietary contributors to high triglycerides are alcohol, sugary foods, refined flours, and saturated and trans fats. This is the progression of liver disease. Um, that's what a healthy liver looks like, fatty liver. I, I worked at the um, Hasbro Pediatric um, Obesity Clinic, the health clinic. We were seeing fatty liver in kids. Like it, it's, it's really sad, um, but this can happen. The good news is fatty liver in NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, where you start to get inflammation is reversible. Cirrhosis is not. So, um, People come to us with elevated, um, we check their liver enzymes to look for fatty liver and every, almost everyone has reversed it within the month if they're, if they're sticking with it. That's the good news. So it doesn't lead to cirrhosis. So this is our, we don't have a lot of N on that because most people don't have fatty liver disease that come to us, but we're seeing good results there. And um, we also started measuring high sensitivity CRP, C-reactive protein. It's a marker of inflammation. There are lots of things that can make it go up, but this HS1 is more specific to cardiac disease. So um, these are the norms. Less than one is low risk. One to three is average risk and over three is high risk. So we repeat it. You know, our N is only 16. Anyone who had greater than three, their average drop is 2.5. And th this is statistically significant. Um, so we're about to publish these results, which is very exciting. I just want to mention this. I know it's not cardiovascular disease, but this is diabetes itself is a risk factor for cardiac disease. Insulin resistance is um, super common. Prediabetes is what happens before you get type 2 diabetes. And the um, at the cellular level, what's happening is when people consume excess calories, excess fat, and have excess body fat, they have fat not just you know under their skin and in their organs, but inside the cells. And when you get fat accumulating inside the cells, it interferes with the function of the insulin receptor. Um, so the insulin can't work. That's what's leading to the insulin resistance. Um, and I feel like that's poorly understood by a lot of people. And everyone's like, oh, you should eat a low carb diet, but it, it's really about the quality of the carbs. Whole grains are actually really good for type two diabetes and insulin resistance. So um, this is a summary. We, we don't have great data from diabetes because we only do it for a month and you're supposed to recheck the A1C every three months. So. If you recheck it only after a month, it's it, it's you know it's not really good medicine. So we were kind of doing it because we wanted to know, but it was a little too early. So they were usually drop people who had elevated A1Cs. They were dropping like 0.1 in a month, which is great. Um, but 
what we did see is that people in our class who had prediabetes, um, meaning their A1C was between 5.7 and 6.4, they were reversing it to below normal levels, which is awesome. And people who had type 2 diabetes and were on medication were checking their glucoses. We were seeing better glucose control, people coming off their medication, um, and the A1C is going down. So type 2 diabetes is completely reversible with um, a proper diet. So not new information. Over 2,000 years old, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. This is my garden. So what if there were a pill that reversed um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, reverse coronary, one pill that did all that? It would be like this crazy, super popular pill that everyone would want. It would be the most popular pill in America. And it's available in food. So I kind of talk about what is in the magic pill. Um, it's basically a whole food plant-based diet with no added sugar, oil, salt things without labels. And in studies, a whole food plant-based diet has been shown to prevent, improve, and even reverse heart disease, type two diabetes, obesity, lung disease, brain diseases, infections, colon, blood, breast, prostate cancers, kidney disease, high blood pressure, liver disease, autoimmune diseases, depression, and Parkinson's. And it's pretty incredible. A, a few years ago, before I was like, totally on this whole food plant-based bandwagon. I was just educating myself on nutrition as a physician and I got board certified in obesity medicine. And I was asked by Babson College to, to design three different talks for the most popular complaints of the employees at, at Babson. And one was um, heart disease, one was like GI problems and one was like aches and pains, like inflammation. And I did the research and I came up with like, it's the same thing. <laughs> Like an anti-inflammatory diet is an anti-cancer diet, is an anti-heart um, attack diet. So um, the research is there. So as a guide, like if you were advising for yourself or for your um, patients, this is a guide that I use when thinking about like what a meal should look like in a plant-based diet without meat, without cheese, what does it look like? Half is fruits and vegetables, a quarter is whole grains, and a quarter is some kind of plant-based protein source um, made from legumes. The only thing missing is B12. So people that are strictly um, not eating any animal product should be on a B12 supplement. So the magic pill has lots of vegetables, especially leafy greens and all different colors. And we call the Hasbro Rainbow Garden that because the message was, did you eat the rainbow today? And we would try to get the kids to like eat every color of the rainbow. And each bed was a different color of the rainbow. And it's really important, you know, when you learn about phytonutrients and all the antioxidants and fruits and vegetables, you'll understand why, um, you know, the medicine behind it, but um, eat the rainbow with fruits as well. Lots of fresh fruits, especially berries, super high in antioxidants. Eat more legumes. Legumes are kind of the mainstay of a plant-based um, diet, the protein, and should be consumed two or three times a day. Whole grains in their whole state, not refined. So this is quinoa, but buckwheat, farro, millet, um, amaranth. There's a lot to discover if you're not familiar with them. And nuts and seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, super healthy form of omega-3 fatty acids. So one simple way to kind of think about food is that A to F thing as students. I know like, yeah, like who only, I try to eat A and B foods. Like that's how, what I want to do for my body. So I focus on um, A foods in general are, you know, necessary for our body to function optimally in their natural state, unprocessed, unrefined, free of artificial anything. Um, and not containing anything that's been shown to increase rates of disease like cancer or heart disease. So here's a summary. There's A plus A and A minus and then B food. So this is what I try to eat all the time. And um, the A plus foods have no labels. So whole fruits and vegetables, legumes and whole grains. You could only eat A plus foods. Um, a foods have are like, you know, crackers or breads or pastas made from whole greens or legumes. 
nut seeds, A minus is the nut milks, um, white rice or bread. And then B foods are veggie burgers and kind of processed plant-based foods. I put C in parentheses because some are much worse than others. If the first three ingredients are oil or refined um, flour or sugar, I, it's a C. So that's how I kind of define it. So this is seafoods or oil, sugars, um, D is animal products and dairy products, eggs, and F is fried foods, processed animal um, products, burgers. And this is a great resource to share with um, patients. It's a free app called Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen. And it goes through like the three servings of beans, one serving of berries, and you like click on it. And there's like also like an information button where you can um, get the serving size or watch a video. Um, there's more, this isn't all of them, but it's a great way to make sure you're getting all the nutrition you need, all the protein you need, all the iron and calcium you need. We teach people how to read labels and the kind of plant doc rule is the first three ingredients should have no oil, sugar, or refined flours. And it's really hard to find that. It's, it, it seems like a simple thing, but if you look at your granola bars and your um, breakfast cereal, I challenge you to see if you have one without that. Um, and then we teach them this 336 rule, fats less than three grams, fiber greater than three grams and sugar less than six grams just kind of a guide. So I'm just gonna show you some examples like people say, well, what do you eat? So a typical breakfast, I make homemade granola every week. I know it might sound crazy, but I have like a basket that has all the ingredients in it. And then it takes me like probably in 10, 15 minutes, I can throw it all together and then I just bake it. It's so good. It's like my favorite thing. So I have it with berries, with almond milk, green tea. I do, I actually do um, espresso every morning with oat milk that's steamed and frothed with turmeric and um, mushroom powder. It's so good. Mushrooms have really powerful anti-cancer effects. So I feel like I want to get my turmeric, my spices. It's like this Jammu spice, actually. It has like 10 different spices in it, but it's my turmeric, my anti-inflammatory for the day. You could also do a tofu scramble with um vegetables, snacks. Um, we do a lot of homemade hummus because most store-bought hummuses have a lot of oil in it. Um, you can make hummus out of um, edamame. You can throw in roasted red peppers. You can throw in broccoli. Like I do nuts every day. I have fruit every day, um, celery, carrots. I always have avocados every day, make kale chips. I love soups and there's a million um, different ways of making soups, but this is miso or butternut squash soup. This one has like a Thai twist. It has like lime and tamari in it and ginger, it's so good. And then when thinking about making your dinners or your lunches, just remember this um, power plate with the fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. So here's some examples of, um, this isn't a whole meal, obviously, but like you can make breaded food if it's breaded with flaxseed and it's a flaxseed egg, not, not egg. It, if you, a flaxseed egg is when you take a tablespoon of flaxseed and three tablespoons of warm water and you whisk it together and let it sit, it forms this like gelatinous substance and you can use it like an egg. So you dip these in that and then you dip it in um, herbed bread, you know, whole wheat bread crumbs and bake it, not fried. Vegan, like whole food plant-based salads are not just like lettuce, tomato, and cucumber, but always have like, you know, sprouts and some beans and some whole grains added. I love putting farro on my salads. Um, this is one of our signature dishes. It's, it's so simple, but, um, and plant docs, it's what we always do at our first cooking class. It's called any bean, any green, any grain. And, and it's like, when you don't know what to make for dinner, you just go and pick any bean, pick a green and pick a grain. And you just make those three things. And then you make some delicious sauce. We have a whole handout of like amazing oil-free sauces that only have healthy ingredients. This is a cashew lemon tahini sauce with mustard and miso. And this is always like a huge hit. 
vegan chili. Chili doesn't have to be just like meat. This is, you can see cauliflower and zucchini and olives and with all the chili spices along with the beans. Um, braised tofu with spinach, quinoa and brown rice. This is a barbecue jackfruit sandwich with a broccoli slaw. Bro roasted Brussels sprouts with farro and mushrooms, roasted root veggies. Um, I love making burritos, but I don't put the sour cream or cheese in it. I'll do like black beans and mushrooms. And I make my own guacamole with cilantro and salsa. I love mushrooms, any kind of mushrooms. King trumpet mushrooms are cool. They're the only mushroom grown for their stem. And if you cut them crosswise, you can make little scallop type things. Um, in my clinic at Hasbro, we had a lot of a big Hispanic population. So we figured out how to do like grilled plant, um, plantains and baked plantains as opposed to deep frying them. So people could eat their well, the foods that they were culturally familiar with, but in a healthier way. Mac and cheese can be totally done healthy. If you do like a whole grain or bean-based um, elbow and then you make the um, macaroni and then you make the sauce with, um, you can do butternut squash or cauliflower with carrots and then you add certain spices and it gets that cheesy um, flavor with um, using nutritional yeast and garlic and onion powder. You can literally grill any vegetable or mushrooms black bean chili, antioxidant salad with lots of berries and walnuts are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, blueberries. And here's some grilled portobello mushrooms over brown rice and arugula. All right, that's it for food. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave you with my quote um, that I feel like it's medical neglect to not tell your patients that the food they choose to eat is causing their disease. So I feel like they need to know, like if they're choosing to eat a standard American diet, they should just know that there's this link. If no one tells them, they don't know. And it's also medical neglect to not tell them that healing foods they could be eating would actually reverse their disease with no adverse outcome. People can choose what they want to do, right? They can choose to eat, you know, bacon, cheeseburgers, and whatever for the rest of their life. But they should know that it's it's the, it's the cause of their their health problems. We can't make patients change their mind. But I'm so frustrated by patients that don't know. I ask every in my pediatric obesity clinic and all these kids with diabetes. All the moms had obesity and diabetes too, and I ask every single one of them. Has your doctor ever told you that diabetes is reversible? And not one patient ever said yes. And I just think that's medical neglect. So what time is it? 